Hi, uh, this is Ankur Dinesh. Uh, the, the key discussion today we are going to have is, is a fundamental question that can online be bigger than offline? That, that's really the question that we are going to ask. Now, it's not really that uh, we're saying that in totality it can be bigger, maybe bigger, but um, can it be bigger in categories? Can it be bigger in some shape, in a silos, in a niche? Can it be bigger in two years, five years, ten years? So that's really the core of the session and which Rajesh uh, will, will be moderating and taking the place of, uh, right. But before, uh, till the time Rajesh and Kurian join in, I can actually leave it, uh, start with Sandeep uh, or, or Dave maybe here and at least take their opinion about this subject for two minutes and then by the time these guys will join in. Right, Dave? So I'll, I'll take my two minutes uh, on Ankur's question. So, uh, you know, if I have understood question correctly, basically he's asking can on, uh, online retail be bigger than the offline retail? I would, uh, I would say no. Uh, and uh, and uh, there are se several, first because I'm saying this because we have seen this uh, in other countries where it could have become bigger than offline retail, but it has not become. So as I mentioned actually in my prior session, uh, US has a 6% penetration for e-commerce China has 14%, India has 0.1%. So, you know, that 0.1%, you know, in my view, that 0.1% could be 6% by 2020, and that can create a 3 lakh crore rupees or 60 billion US dollar opportunity. But, you know, it can, it, 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 you cannot say never, but, you know, I think it's highly unlikely that e-commerce will be bigger, uh, you know, than the offline retail. There are several things. I mean, there are a lot of things you just cannot buy online unless you you uh, you physically touch and feel them. You know, yeah, you know. I, yes, I mean, there are companies who are giving you that opportunity, but you know, let's see the sustainability of that. Uh, and then, then I would say there are a lot of things which are practically not possible to be sold online. There are a lot of things which are time sensitive and location sensitive. You know, if you need something uh, immediately. You know, it does not matter how sophisticated is your operation. You know, you know, it cannot be delivered in half an hour, for example. So, anyhow, I'll I'll let other panelists add add. But my but my view is, you know, India is 0.1% penetration, a 2% penetration by 2015, and a 6% penetration by 2020 is very likely. And for that to also happen, multiple tipping points of have to happen, and government regulatory environment has to be at least directionally supportive. I would uh, second my opinion in terms of I don't see online to you know be the major player compared to offline in the overall retail space and uh, few challenges in terms of feel and fit uh, there is a huge uh, learning and technology development that has to happen to ensure that feel and fit factor is totally eliminated second the numbers tell itself for example it's not even one percent today I would not assume it to be more than 10-15% in another 5-10 to 10 years. Uh, even if we achieve that, that would be a great achievement. Third, in terms of e-commerce has some fundamental uh, design principle, for example, delivery, etc. A lot of uh, product in order to be delivered uh, to the end customer requires, uh, requires the business uh, angle to it. So if it doesn't make sense, I don't think uh, that it will ever come as a product offering on the online space. It might start as an experiment, but it will fail. So, uh, and uh, again, as a community buy, uh, online has not yet reached a stage where the community, community buying has been achieved, which I think uh, we will be able to achieve, but it will take another uh, few years to do that. Thanks. Hi, I think. So I'm Rajesh Nahar. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of cbazaar.com. We'll just give you a quick brief of what cbazaar is. Uh, we sell Indian ethnic wear across the world. So uh, I mean, to this particular uh, panel, what I feel is uh, fundamentally the way I would look at online is basically an, uh, an another channel for an, any offline establishment to sell the merchandise. 
So uh, I wouldn't compare online offline directly, but online is a uh, channel which any offline establishment definitely should look at uh, as a uh, upcoming uh, channel, and there is going to be a big uh, opportunity in this particular channel. And if 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 uh, the, the establishment misses out this opportunity, that could be a big threat going forward. Again, from the consumer point of view, this particular channel is going to be a, a, a great driver for discovery. Uh, so if, if the establishment is not available online, and given that a consumer, I mean, if you look at till 80s, I mean, a consumer who had, I mean, who always have only 24 hours time in a day, used to spend uh, for entertainment, will spend time on television. And then in the, in the 90s, cables had come. In the 2000s, we have mobiles. And uh, then now we have uh, tablets and various other forms of uh, entertain entertainment. In that perspective, the time what a consumer has got has divided on, on the traditional media and also on the, the new medias. So if the merchants or if the establishments is available in various forms, that gives a lot of advantage for the establishments in the long run. So, I mean, off online is just another channel for any offline establishment, and they have to be uh, available on online. That's that's what is my say. Okay. Maybe Actually, you can introduce yourself and then start. Sorry, we are both late to the panel. Maybe you can introduce yourself. So just introduce myself. Hi, my name is Biju Korean, uh, President and Chief Executive Lifestyle at Reliance Retail. And I seem to be amongst the fully offline retailer here. So I'm a little intimidated by the fact that, you know, the rest of the people are trying to uh, part of the online community. As far as I'm, I, the way I see it is that uh, I don't think there is a debate about offline or online. I think the debate is about how to serve the customer. And if you really look at it, uh, customers don't differentiate between offline and online saying that, I will buy this offline and I will buy that online or whatever. Uh, customers are there across this country and what we need to remember at the end of the day is that uh, it's a large market. You have different customer segments across different population strata. You have different customer segments across uh, different age categories. You have different customer segments across different product categories. So if I were to let's say look at a trisection of age, uh, city, and product, and look at, let's say, somebody who wants to buy apparel in the age group of, say, 20 to 35 in a city like Mumbai, and then say that, you know, will this be an offline or an online customer? If somebody is staying in Mumbai, say, Linking Road, they have an opportunity to be able to actually step out of their house, get onto Linking Road, and shop in any store there, if somebody is staying on Linking Road, they have an opportunity in the night to sit in front of a screen, which could be a, uh, a computer or a laptop or whatever, and then look at opportunities, look at choices which might be available on some e-commerce site. Now, how do we put, in, put a definition on that customer and say that that's an offline customer, they will only buy offline or they will only buy online? So I think what will happen is that as long as we understand that it is a retail business, as long as we understand that we have a customer in front of us, as long as we understand that that customer has a need, and at the end of the day, a combination of factors, ranging from speed to service to cost and various other things, whoever is able to finally provide a better deal will certainly be the, with the, will be the one who succeeds. So just because you're an online player doesn't mean that it's a guaranteed success. Just because you're an offline player doesn't also mean that it is guaranteed success. Uh, what we need to understand is unless both of us actually keep a very good, have a very good understanding of the customer, and are able to then focus on their needs, we certainly will struggle in terms of serving the customer. Uh, fantastic. So let me introduce myself. My name is Rajesh Sahani. I'm supposed to be in charge of this panel. It's my job to make it interesting. I apologize, I'm slightly late, but we'll have fun now. So Dave, let's get some fun started. So look at the, the 
context of India is that here the organized retail formation and the e-commerce is happening at the same time, unlike the West, where first the organization of retail happened, uh, consolidation of industry took place, and then the e-commerce came in. And in that sense, it's a, it's a context of taking market share away from organized retail. We are in a very different context here, where both the revolutions are happening at the same time. And if I look at, look at it from the viewpoint of private capital, private equity is already a very big player in uh, organized retail in India, and is stepping up its act. And venture has taken almost 800 million to a billion dollar bet on e-commerce. And I hear that private equity is not too excited about e-commerce. Uh, what, what's happening here in the context of private capital? Yeah, so if you look at uh, 2011, about, about let's say five to six hundred million dollars went into e-commerce from venture investors in India. Last year, 2012, was down from there significantly. Um, and then this year is, my guess, is going to be even slower. What's happened, I think, is the limited number of venture investors that there are have made their bets. And now we need to see what, sh what happens with the companies that they've invested in. Um, and what happened in 2011 was clearly an overfunding of the market by, quite, by several multiples. Uh, and a lot of money went essentially direct transfer from the venture, sort of our venture investor pockets to Google's pockets as marketing dollars, right? Marketing rupees, sorry. Um, and so, um, there's a question about uh, negative unit economics. Can a lot of these companies make money at scale or will they lose money with every sale that they make? And there are companies that are doing better, worse. There are higher margin categories, lower margin categories. So we'll see. But I think this year for sure is a wait and see. There's also regulatory overhang in the yeah. sector that's scaring some people away. And so I think overfunding, a lot of negative unit economics, regulatory overhang, I think there's a lot so, of wait and see. So retail is a long time, long term bet, right, Biju? It's it's ten year bet, it's fifteen year bet. To get to scale, you need that kind of time, right? And I'm quite certain when venture came into this industry, they understood this, that it's a long term bet. Uh, what did they get wrong? What did they not anticipate? Why did so much of capital come? You said oversupply of capital. I'll give you my opinion. What is the disappointment here? I'll give you my opinion. I'm sure there are many. One is sort of a nothing to do with e-commerce specifically, which is that if you look over the last 10, 15 years of new um, technology-oriented sectors or even other sectors that are created in India, you tend to see a rush. Mm -hmm. uh, even you know, matrimonial sites in India, when they first, there were many job sites, there were many. And over time, it sort of winnows back down to a few winners. Right. In e-commerce, it was supersized. I mean, 300 companies is what I've heard. Uh, got created horizontals, verticals, different business models, um, and people bought a lot of models from the U.S. Uh, that the market isn't ready for right now. Everybody's sort of moving back to just sell products. Uh, right. Don't make it subscription commerce. Don't make it social commerce. Just make it basic and let it happen. So I think a bit of exuberant sort of uh, irrationalism in this market. I think we now we just have to wait and see what happens. Okay, so is the disappointment that the market didn't grow fast enough? I don't think so. I think the market, uh, and as was talked about in the keynote, is growing very fast. There's clearly demand. There's no issue around demand. Right. The issue is around the, the heavy discounting, you know, hyper competition between the retailers, and too much money in the system in some sense. Okay. So you see this year as a year of cleansing of the excesses of the past? Yeah. And some stronger businesses emerging out of that cleansing? Absolutely. I think this morning, Zovi acquired Inkfruit. Right. That was a, you know, but that's more like investors are the same on both the sides. They're sort of cleaning their act. Well, there are only 10 to 15 investors, investors in the market right. to begin with. So they're all in multiple so these, companies. These are really not M&As. These are more sort of convenience arrangements between the investors to sort of consolidate the capital around. Uh, and I don't really think founders are benefiting from these m and Is that no, correct? No, no, no. It's always hard to bring two companies together, cultures, right. equity holdings, incentives. I mean, it usually doesn't, doesn't work out. Okay. So le let's uh, go to our colleague from Jabong. You guys have taken a big bet. Infinite pool of capital, it seems, you gathered somewhere in the world. And the popular perception is you're throwing money at the problem. Prove us wrong. Tell us what you're doing right. 
it's always better if the market opinion is that we are uh, heavily funded. I will not try to debate that. What I would try to debate is we are burning money in terms of we are uh, spending money where it does not need to be. I agree with uh, in terms of uh, a year back <coughs> when we had actively started uh, selling online, the way the whole market was behaving. So in terms of some of the business fundamentals were being compromised. For example, illogical pricing, illogical discounting, etc., were happening. Uh, we were delivering products which were lower than 100 rupees free of cost. So basic uh, maths would not work out. All the decision has to be fair to all the angles. And it can be a long term or a mid term objective. But in mid term, it should be sustainable. So all the decisions we take, we apply those three filters in terms of are we being fair to customers? Are we being fair to the stakeholders in terms of investors? And are we being fair to our own team, the employees? We were slightly late in terms of entry. Uh, we made our website really live in January 2012. Can you keep it closer to you? So at that time, the need of the R was that we have to be aggressive in terms of making ourselves prominent. Conscious decision. And in terms of what we achieved, we wanted to achieve. And uh, uh, now we are one of the most trafficked website. We have loyal customers, repeating purchases, etc. So uh, again, yeah, uh, compared to others, our so is it going to be end of good times for customers? Sorry? End of good times, no more deals, buy at just marginal discounts to I, Biju's I shop or no discount? No, I would not say that. Illogical discounting has to stop. Okay. To me, uh, and it's my opinion, discounting has an objective of liquidation. Mm -hmm. It's never to buy sales. If you are compromising that business fundamental, either you are cheating your business or the customers. Either by design you always wanted to discount, and hence the design is to discount. Or you bought at a full price knowing fully well that I have to sell at full price, but I'll discount because I want more customers. So if you're going to compete on convenience and not on price with the uh, regular retail, what is that one thing in your strategy that's going to make customers come to you? Is it what in that convenience is the, the foremost thing? So I will say two factors, not only convenience, price is another factor, mm -hmm. price sensitive. So if the market is being played on price, then finally the way the airlines happen, everywhere the price goes, keeps going down, then it starts getting corrected. And two is convenience. Convenience, I would say, more in terms of the overall experience of shopping. Two front to it, everything went right. You really liked the product, it fitted you well, and you were fine because the delivery was prompt, the products were of the right quality, etc. And the second is an exception, where the customer actually faced some issue, and then uh, and the customer actually faced some issue, and then how did you handle it? Right. Might be a delay in delivery because of a number of unforeseen reasons, or the product did not fit, or the quality was not right. How did you manage that? Did you earn the trust back? Because already the customer has gone through some pain. So I would create into two parts. One is, the uh, did I design it right to ensure that he gets the right experience? And two, even if I design at heart level, something will go wrong. What did I create to ensure that even in case of exception, I am able to convince the customer we tried our level best and we'll keep on doing it till the time you get convinced. Thanks. So Sandeep, let, let me uh, engage with you a little bit. Uh, so you started at almost the same time as Jabong started. And I've been talking to investors and uh, some of the founders of different e-commerce companies, and there seems to be a shift in business model towards marketplace. So everyone seems to be saying, you know, inventory models are really not working out, unit economics are bad. Uh, marketplace is the new sort of thing that is being marketed to investors. Uh, how, how are you seeing this transition? I think you are in a marketplace model, if I'm not right, wrong. Yeah. Well, first of all, let me say, I must say that I'm a little scared of Rajesh. He's asking very direct question and I'm sitting closest to him. <laughs> so, okay, uh, with that, you know, so, um, you know, <laughs> no, it, it's, it's stuck here, no, that, stuck here. that's okay. Right? I'm going far away from you. <laughs> so, bad time for you. 
So, okay, so no, no, I think Rajesh, uh, I think uh, I must say is uh, adding a lot, uh, lot of interesting angle to this uh, panel discussion. So happy to be part of uh, a panel moderated by Rajesh. And you did not have to go this far, but okay. So he here is something, uh, you know, so Shop Clues actually, uh, you know, Shop Clues is, uh, is actually India's first and largest managed marketplace. You know, we are, we started as a marketplace. We, that is how we took foot in the door. Marketplace is what we sleep with. Marketplace is what we wake up with. Marketplace is our DNA. We have not changed our business model because now that is what investors find it fancy. This is what we had done day one when I landed in this country 14 months back. Not too many people understood marketplace. And I used to feel frustrated. My team used to feel frustrated, but in the hindsight, that was the best thing which happened to us. Because if they had understood, there'd be 30 other marketplaces or at least starting to call marketplace. So yeah, I mean, you know, I think, uh, look, I, I grew up in this country. I was in Silicon Valley last 15 years. I did not come back here, one, because I wanted to move back. Second is because I was also drinking the Kool-Aid that e-commerce is going to become very big. Uh, and, you know, I just have to be there, right? I saw this unique opportunity along with my team. My, most of them are actually sitting here. Uh, we saw this unique opportunity that A, India e-commerce is ready for prime time. B, almost 100% of the business model before us were inventory-led model. And then we did not think those to be offering profitability and scalability anytime in the next one decade. Uh, and then if you look at globally, except Amazon in US, Every other country, a marketplace model has ultimately become market leader. We have a long way to go, but to answer Rajesh's question, we started as a marketplace because we think that is a right model for Indian e-commerce. For the last 3,000 years, from the time when the spices went from Kerala to England, or a leather went from Kanpur to, to Western Europe, the silk route until today, no single retailer has become more than 3 to 4% of Indian retail. India is a very fragmented retail market. There are different pockets for different things. Moradabad for home furnishing, Chennai for Kanzi Varam Sari, Panipat for handloom, and so on. Delhi has been a big area for branding and sourcing. There's low capital investment. Channels are inefficient. And, uh, and there's a te technology adoption is very little. And that, in my view, create a very healthy ground for a marketplace type of model. India, as per McKinsey, India has 10 million people who either have brand or manufacture or are retailer. Basically, they do retailing for living. And we are a platform to harness their inventory, to bring them online so that they can focus on retailing. And we can provide technology, payment, delivery, and marketing. So you run a very tight ship, I know that. And you are angel funded. Have you raised Series A so far? Uh, we uh, well, we actually we have not publicly spoken a lot about our uh, funding. But what is publicly known, I can disclose that we we were first the company was f funded by me and my team. Then we did a very sizable angel round in Silicon Valley, and then we did a sizable Series A. Uh, sizable in the sense, okay, I mean, uh, you know, Series A. Uh, in early last year from with our popular VCs. Uh, so we have not disclosed the size and the size and the VCs. And after that, we have not disclosed anything. I just wanted to get your sense of, uh, um, as you interact with the venture community and the investor community, what's the sense you're getting about uh, their feeling about e-commerce sector and specifically of, around your specific business model that you've chosen? What's the appetite yeah, like? So, sure. So I think, uh, honestly, as I mentioned earlier, you know, when I landed in this country, we were not looking for additional capital because we just had raised very sizable angel, and our investors were first some of the early employees of Facebook, Google, Netscape, etc. So we were very fortunate for a lot of these uh, high-caliber executive and serial entrepreneur to invest in us. So we were not necessarily in the, uh, you know, but I would still, uh, you know, meet VCs. Uh, we continue to meet. I mean, we're part of the same ecosystem. If you are an entrepreneur and you don't miss, meet VCs, you are doing something wrong. So, uh, you know, so we, we have been meeting VCs at different stages. 
uh, and I must say, not too many, pe very pe lot of a lot of VCs, uh, and uh, you know, uh, they were very skittish about marketplace model. Right? They were very skittish about marketplace model, and uh, during that time, in my view, the cracks in the inventory-led e-commerce model had not started to emerge either. But you know, our honestly, our our original thesis was that uh, you know, uh, uh, to to Mr. Sinha's point, uh, you know, like you know. Uh, uh, you know, you have to do things which are sustainable, like he, ha he very ha nicely articulated three different stakeholders. Uh, so same way, you know, our thesis is that, you know, we saw a lot of irrational behavior, but, you know, that irrational behavior did not impact VC because VCs invest money because they want to see a business scaling and ultimately have a path to profitability. So, you know, I think when we started, there was still a scaling part of the business, less emphasis on profitability. But I think in last one year, I think ultimately, you know, business has to be solved on a fundamental basis. So I think that uh, awareness has gone up, and I must say, and over the time, we, you know, we were not, when we started, we were not used to seeing other companies selling coupons or something else saying we are marketplace, right? We were the only marketplace. So when, what we started seeing is a lot of companies now saying we are, mar you know, we are marketplace. And, and then, you know, and then the things they, they were doing, honestly, it's my opinion, but it felt to me more like aligning uh, a company for a next round of funding rather than truly believing the underpinnings of a marketplace. But by now, to answer Rajesh's question, I think marketplace is very well understood business model. Uh, but one thing I also would say is just because we are doing it, a couple of others doing it, and they seem to be doing well, does not mean marketplace is an easy model. By no means I'm discouraging anyone to start up, uh, you know, we are happy to compete with anyone on a healthy grounds. That is not the point. But like, you know, they, you know I think uh, they mentioned, uh, you know, this, you know, like uh, I think you gave an example of some other industry. You know, this irrational exuberance, you know, I remember speaking in the same conference last year and everyone thought, you know, we'll start e-commerce, any business, any business model and, and life will be great after that. Does not matter whether it is marketplace, inventory led or not. As, as, as Parveen also mentioned, I'll read it the same thing. You have to focus about fundamentals. You have, to, you, you, have to, you have to be accountable to yourself, to the people who work with you, and the, you know, ultimately, ultimately, does not matter what is the business model. It's a buyer. It's a customer who decides everything. So, you know. Okay, it, so on that note, let's bring Manoj. So let's talk about customer. So, uh, Biju also sort of drew out the sketch of the customer. Who is this customer and what is the value proposition that e-commerce offers that the offline retail cannot offer to that customer? I think uh, a customer is uh, essentially looking for three things. He's looking for choice, which is does that channel bring him what he's looking for? Is it uh, giving him the price value equation which he's looking for? Doesn't mean discount, but the price value equation. And the third is the service part, because whether it's offline or online, there's always a service part in, in a distribution business. So, um, and this is what he looks for when he goes out shopping. And there are two kinds of shopping. One is the shopping you do for pleasure and entertainment, and second is the compulsive shopping which you need on an everyday basis. So depending on what he's looking for and what he's shopping for, the choice of the channel emerges. And <clears throat> where I think uh, the consumer is moving to is search on internet has become an established thing in his mind. And that's where it all starts. And you go and search for products, searching for information. That's how the whole uh, book business happened on the internet because the inventory available on search was much larger than you will ever find in a bookstore. Uh, that's where electronics happened because the kind of product detailing you could find online was much bigger than the salesman at the neighborhood store could ever tell you about the refrigerator you want to buy. Uh, so search is uh, going to drive how channels will be able to adapt to consumers. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a small example of my ex-job, which I did in Bata. Um, we had a lot of stores. 
we put up a brochure website where we had pictures of our products. This was 2007. The next year, once the store, got, the website got established, we saw a lot of people coming into the physical stores with pictures of the shoes. And that told the organization that yes, there is a probability that we can create an online store, and which is what we did there, you know. So the consumer is using the different channels based upon his requirement. So if he's looking for discount and he finds discount on online store, he buys there. But he is, if he's getting a better discount in an offline store, maybe getting a coupon from Snapdeal or something like that, then he goes to that store and shops there. So, so he's looking always for the best value for himself. And uh, that's where the consumer is evolving into. So just to get a sense of uh, one understanding uh, or one myth, or maybe one reality is that because of lack of choices in smaller towns, B, C, and D, a lot of e-commerce is beginning to happen there. Is that the experience with all of you? I mean, we uh, at all bulk of stuff, your business coming from those towns. Is that uh, right? at all school stuff? Definitely, we we see that happening. Uh, Eighty percent of our business is tier two, tier three, tier four, okay. and uh, the kind of range we sell, the kind of brands and products we bring. Uh, definitely, the small markets do not have access to that that kind of products, which drives consumers to us. So that's a real value proposition. It's a right? real value proposition. And you have similar experience, Rajesh. Yeah. So we have seen that basically uh, consumers coming with C Bazaar, uh, I mean, they're not fundamentally looking at deals or value. I mean, uh, what they're looking at is are they getting the right merchandise? Something which will address to the needs of them. Like we are in the fashion industry and people want to look beautiful. And if we have a merchandise which would make them look beautiful or which would make them feel they're okay, confident when they are wearing that particular outfit, then, you know, deals or, or, or of course they will they will want to get best value for money but but then deals are all the secondary thing first they want to know, get the right uh, product uh, what exactly you know uh, which make which will make you, them you have never competed on price no we have always make sure that we maintain a healthy uh, yeah. cross margins and your initial business model was this nri customer yeah still still we still do is. a lot of business for yeah. nris yeah is it, is it a mythical customer? Is it real? Is it scalable business? The sense I have of M NRI business is it's a very niche market. It's really not a scalable business. No, in terms of scalability, one thing is sure, the market is there. Right. Now, scalability is a question of how exactly you tap the market. Right. Right. So you'll have to be innovative, you'll have to think different, and that's what exactly we're doing. So in terms of understanding that customer, you are supplying fashion products to them. Yeah. And where they have affinity with India, whether it's wedding gear or saris or designer wear. Where, what else is there that could appeal to that customer which could be given from India? Uh, yeah, this is one question which we always ask to ourselves. And we have, I mean, we have seen that there are some more categories which exactly can be mapped to the same customers whom we are targeting. and. Uh, I mean, we'll be soon launching some of these categories, but uh, I mean, we we are we are addressing a problem of a customer here. I mean, the problem here is basically they want to have a strong cultural uh, connect with their uh, you know uh, with their with their motherland, right? And for them, the way to express their connectivity is with the food, what they you know what they consume, or or the clothing, what they wear, or Bollywood, right? So, so we are, we are in, in, in a way, we are addressing to the problem what exactly they have. But that's a different equation what happens for C Bazaar in India, right? In India, there is already a, a large number of retail offline establishments which are selling the products what we are selling. But we have seen that, uh, I mean, one of the uh, good thing what you're seeing from India is the transaction value, you know, uh, from, from consumers in India is significantly, you know, going up, uh, you know, from quarter to quarter. Uh, Again, what we want to position here is how can you make sure that people love your merchandise and buy okay. from you? Okay, so draw out a profile of an NRI sitting in Chicago for me and draw out a profile of a typical customer from, let's say, a B-class town. Who, who, who or she is? Just sketch it for me. Imagine her. So uh, a customer from Chicago would be someone who has, uh, uh, you know, who has to attend a party 
or who has to attend an event uh, which could be a couple of weeks away and uh, she wants to wear something which uh, none of her uh, you know the, the the close group in which she's in touch with uh, they don't have and and she wants to be the the one who is most talked about in that particular event right, right? and 35 years old sorry how old 25 35 <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we're looking at 22 to 40 years. 22 to 40. Uh, so these are first generation NRI. First, second. Okay. I mean, uh, in, uh, uh, we are also selling to uh, non-Indians as well. Okay. Or non-South Asians as well. You're beginning to do that? Is no, it we becoming are, we sizable? Are, yeah. yeah. Well, there is a market validation for absolutely, that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because a lot of South Asians are getting married to uh, non-South Asians. Or there, there, is, there are events which people would want to wear Indian outfits for that particular event. And draw out the sketch of this Gujarati women in some town for me. Uh, India. Yeah, I mean, someone who wants to wear, uh, uh, I mean, uh, a Patola sari, Rajkot Patola sari, and she wants to look traditional, uh, and she's not able to find that particular sari, right? Uh, and, and then she goes to see Bazaar to buy that. Or she wants to wear Kanjivaram, and... and uh, accessibility of that particular sari is not uh, easy for her or she may have to go to Bombay and get that. So that's the kind of customers whom we are. Right. So Biju, you are the only one here with uh, offline business. Do you, do, do you think e-commerce in, <coughs> in your business? And if yes, how do you think about e-commerce in the context of your product mix, your reach, and what's the role of e-commerce in your business strategy? Um, no, we think it certainly, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think you need an omni-channel strategy as far as a customer is concerned. Traditionally, the customer has been used to shopping from a store, and now there are new ways of reaching that customer. And I think when there are new ways of reaching that customer, unless you embrace these technologies and add them to your armory of the way you reach your customer, uh, it certainly won't work. So uh, e-commerce, while we might be a brick and mortar retailer today, uh, in the long run, certainly the addition of e-commerce as a channel of sale for us is an integral part of our business strategy. So there is no doubt about that. Going back to this Gujarati customer in uh, some part of uh, Gujarat, hopefully, uh, who wants to buy a Patola sari, uh, the way we see it is that uh, sari shopping is a social occasion. You bring in your family, you bring in friends, uh, you try a hundred to choose two, uh, you drape them onto your body and then see what looks nice and then after that you choose, seek the opinion of your, of your buying group before you make up your mind. Uh, to our mind, something like that to be replicated on a website uh, we think is going to be quite difficult. Uh, and even if it becomes easier, for somebody to adopt that as a process of buying uh, to the exclusion of brick and mortar retail, we think it will take a long while. So to that extent, I think uh, categories where e-commerce will certainly have an uh, early start, uh, create some impact, are going to be different from the, the wear, try, experience categories and where you still you know, need to do a lot of these things. So you know, as somebody mentioned, books, music, uh, electronic products, things which are branded, form defined, uh, model number defined, where you're competing on price and where you say that, you know, I, I, can, I can sell it on the basis of very little communication with the customer, those categories will certainly do well as far as uh, e-commerce goes. So in 2015, two years ahead, what percentage of your business you see coming from e-channels? Uh, I think in 2015, if you ask me for a percentage, probably less than a percent. One percent. Probably less. Yes. When do you think it will become 10 percent? Uh, I think for the market in this country, it will take us at least about five to six years before the e-commerce market in this country gets to double digits. Let's say 2020. 2017, uh, 18 is I think by the time you will get your current less than 1% e-commerce market of the total retail market to get to something like about 10% of the total retail market. Because what is the total retail market today? Roughly in the region of about 450, 475 billion. 
And uh, if you look at it five years hence, the estimate is roughly in the region of about 700 billion. So if you want to have a 70 billion e-commerce market from today's e-commerce market size, I think it's going to take a long while. So that is why I think it will take at least about five to six years for this e-commerce market to get to be about 10% of the total Indian retail market. Fair enough. So uh, in the sense of uh, going forward, so very clearly you have a roadmap of dominating the retail here in all sectors. Uh, do you see uh, Reliance turning into an acquisition, acquisitive entity of some of these guys to fill some of your gaps? Uh, or do you think about it? Well, are, you, are these companies even today on your horizon? Well, it's difficult to be able to give you an answer on that, but the way I see it is that if it fulfills, a, if it fills a gap uh, at a cost which is going to be cheaper than the cost of setting it up yourself, then certainly one would look at it uh, as being an opportunity for an acquisition. But if, let's say, the, the, the price is too high and you can do it cheaper, then there's no reason for us to, you know, to look at any acquisition. We're already, you know, we're looking at rolling out a 4G uh, network across this country uh, at some point of time, hopefully this year or next. And I think that's a backbone. And on that backbone, you're already looking at, you know, then writing commerce, writing content, and various other things. So, you know, it comes naturally for us then once we have 4G. Excellent. So it always comes back to people like you, Dave. Always does. Right. Putting the money. Who's going to fund organized retail money in this country? Right Who's going to fund e-commerce in this country? To my mind, there's a big question mark now. How is the e-commerce going to be funded in this country? So there is a regulatory overhang. Uh, there is unit economics issue. And then on top of it, uh, especially private equity players developing cold feet issue, especially for big players. So how is it going to be funded? I think uh, part of, I don't think there's a real, I don't have a definitive answer. My opinion is that part of the market will have to do what a lot of the e-tailers in the U.S. did after the 2000 crash, which is your top line goes down to way less than what it was, but every sale is at a profit. And so several, a substantial portion of the market will go in that direction. Um, and it, it, you know, you stop marketing without making a profit on every sale. Uh, some portion of the market, we believe, um, let's say in the next 12 to 18 months, well before, let's say this year is the opportunity for regulations to progress a little bit because once you have the election cycle coming up, starting, you know, for in next year's, everybody's going to be electioneering. It's all going to be political. It already is, for that matter. But this year, a few of these regulations can go through. My guess is potentially on the digital e-commerce side, there'll be that's an easy one. There's no political issue there. Uh, but on pure retail, I think the regulatory overhang, there might be a little bit of progress, but not a whole lot. So, and there's a set of my my understanding is that there's a set of India-funded, India-capitalized companies that don't want foreign competition. And so, and they have influence. And so, there's gonna be, it's gonna be a while before all this opens up. I'm looking ahead of me. Um, and so, I think the regulatory of Hang stays for a while. And that scares away uh, uh, new investors and existing investors. The final thing is that you look at um, existing e-commerce companies abroad, uh, look at Amazon, uh, Walmart, uh, from both of offline and online angle, and others, I think they have an interest in India, um, but they'll also have to comply with these regulatory sort of things. But they're all looking around um, and are interested in, in, in investing. So there's a potential opportunity there as well. But it's going to be very, very slow from a funding perspective. Specifically, uh, when the venture sort of cycle is where it is, you fund Series A, B, B right, typically. Why, what is the hesitation in private equity to step up here? Private equity typically has not invested in e-commerce anywhere in the world. Is it? Yeah, it's not not a typical private equity is. Even if you look at Flipkart's round, it's more done by MIH and Iconic, right? And even for Jabong, the funding is coming from different sort of a source. Yeah, but uh, that's not private equity. Yeah, that's not private. That's not private. But equity. those are the people who are funding private equity. 
Not really. I mean, MIH is not a private equity. No, firm. It, it, let's say if you look at Jabong's fund. Rocket composition. is not a private equity firm, as far as I know. Um, it's a holding company structure right. in various ways. So if you look at traditional private equity, your KKRs and your other it's and and it's that. not. They're not into the, the, There's a set of small, smaller technology buyout shops, Silver Lake and others. But again, retail is not a category that they go into. So I won't look to that. So the, side. the funding of e-commerce is either going to happen through strategics like MIH and Rocket and Silver Lakes kind of. And you have your growth capital sort of funds like TA and Summit in the right. West and others over here that could. could and be IPOs are quite far away for most of them, right? As an option to access those markets. Yeah, I mean, you know, we've had every time we talk about IPOs in India, there's there's three or four names we throw yeah. that there are: um, Make My Trip and a Nokri and a couple of others. And most most firms have capitalized, have headquartered abroad, so they can go public elsewhere. They don't have the. the so seriously, the, most of these players have their back against the wall, and they will need to innovate so hard to survive, and hopefully thrive. That's I think the the, there's a lot of money been raised. There's money in people's pockets. Right. They need to spend it wisely. Uh, and it's competition. It's going to be brutal. All right. So on that note, maybe we can open for some questions. Is, is that fair? Or unless someone wants to have a final comment, it's fine. Do you have a question? Mr. Manish. No, hi, Manish. Two questions. Can you Can you talk about First question was that should offline companies should or must go online as on today? And what's the second? Second question is that can a novice like me go for an online shop only and dream to make it? Second question, answer is no. Uh, first one I'll ask Viju. <laughs> I hope you got the answer to your second question. He said no. Uh, I'm mostly wrong. That's perseverance and persistence. Uh, the, the first question is that um, certainly I think uh, an offline company will need to go online. Uh, because look at your offline presence. And if you can create an online presence for yourself, you can leverage the power of your offline presence. Uh, currently, we, nobody is really doing that. You know, Everybody is starting the other way around saying that, I want to create an online presence now and then want to do an offline later as in when I scale up. So that's the first. The second is that, uh, you know, online, you come in, you choose what you want. Offline, you come in and you choose more than what you want. And I think that's where most offline players see an advantage for themselves uh, when they look at the difference between online and offline. And the third is that I think there is a certain trust uh, which you can associate. There's a certain comfort factor when you know that you can go back to that particular store and say that, you know, this Patola sari that I bought from you has got a little tear on the side and I want it to be replaced. And that is something which is a simple, easy transaction when you have, let's say, the store in your house, near your house, etc. So to that, to that extent, I think, you know, uh, for offline players, moving online is certainly going to be a huge opportunity. Uh, maybe you want to answer a second question. Uh, the question is, I don't know much about e-commerce, but maybe I have an idea. How should I go about launching it, right? <clears throat> so, you, you know, I think, uh, so on a second question, but to maybe just cover the first one also, I think you, if you are here, that tells me that you think about e-commerce. Right, so I think the sooner you plant the seed, the better it is, right? And uh, so I would say, you know, plant the seed, and then then see, you know, at, uh, you know, uh, you know how how you want to grow. Uh, I mean, I think there are a lot of offerings uh, in the market. If technology is the only thing which is bothering you, there are a lot of technology solution. If technology plus something else is bothering you, there are a lot of solution. There are end-to-end -end solution. We provide one, but again. I think it is up to, first of all, you have to think about it, what, what you know, you want, how you want to play, right? You need to come up with a playbook, like in terms of, 
the choice of business model built by right or some combination and then then also you cannot cheat yourself what is your dna right is this you are doing this because you just happen to saw the ad while having family dinner for one of the e-commerce company and your 14 year old is asking dad why are you not doing e-commerce or is it something you really believe in so but 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 you know but but to answer the question i would say honestly um, i think uh, you know the e-commerce may not be you know as uh, uh, as a gentleman from Reliance mentioned, e-commerce may not be like, let's say, 2%, 10%, 50% any time in maybe in our lifetime, but that does not mean it's not going to be lucrative, right? It, get, it gives a lot of advantages, and if you're thinking about it, you, you have to start planting the seed. This will, and especially if you have a legacy offline businesses, you will actually go through. I was fortunate to straight out of school working in technology companies, right? But if you, if you have a if you have a legacy business, will go through arguably a higher learning curve, a steeper learning curve. So I would say just plant the seed, and, and that's how you create an option value. An option value has no downside risk. You can build it bigger and bigger. I think uh, the, uh, one small example of offline going online that I think could work here in the next few years is using online demand generation to drive online foot traffic. Um, especially in really high, uh, tr high value sort of purchases like furniture and other such things where, you know, having large warehouses with tons of furniture sitting there is very inefficient. But if you can organize them centrally and drive people on from online to go there, that can really help a lot. Uh, and, and so that could be sort of an initial step for some, you know, and my, when I say high order value, I mean like 20, 30, 50,000 dollar or 50,000 rupee order value. Uh, type of uh, I, I think you need to be very sensitive to not start any me too kind of thoughts captured from the West. You have to understand the market dynamics, you have to have a unique insight, you have to see your own capability, whether you can execute it and see an opportunity very differently than the you know, market sees. So if you have that insight, then please go ahead. But if you don't have that unique insight, uh, there are other better businesses to get into. Yeah, please go ahead. Can you give him the mic there? You know, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Traditionally, we saw these vanilla retailers with these, what I call, 80% of the time in the year, they're on 80% discount. Now what you see in e-commerce is a lot of sites with discounts. Now, is this going to be like in vanilla retailing, we saw them vanishing? Is that going to happen with e-commerce sites also, like he said that, 45% of your customers, I don't know when you started, uh, sorry, San Sandeep, when you mentioned that, uh, you know, customers don't come back. So that's my, really, my question. Are these companies who are online going to survive where they're giving huge discounting? So that's something that I would like you to enlighten any of you. Thanks. Yeah, so maybe you can take it uh, in the sense of, is there a loyalty formation? Uh, uh, habits uh, or is it still customer is very fickle and he's moving side to side so what is creating loyalty I think that's what he's getting at. So, <clears throat> I think uh, there would be few customers who would not repeat but uh, again loyalty is uh, we have seen it it's already validated that customers do come back uh, to your second question that uh, in terms of will the discounts etc go up if it was on the design principle itself for example a website which works on liquidation for example, they get all the vendors and uh, brands who want to liquidate their inventory and the model is based on that. It will keep on happening. And the discount seekers, the customers, there would be certain set of customers who are discount seekers. So they will always repeat on discount. So again, you will have to understand the customer to, to you know, ensure that he repeats the purchase. For example, the example of furniture. How frequently will he buy? But will he buy another category? Yes. So are you offering more than one category if you are offering furniture? So those set of questions should be uh, there. In terms of learning, there are uh, few more things to learn as a whole uh, e-commerce ecology in India. But if I have to just see the pattern, uh, I would not say that it's a big concern area. Definitely we can work and improve upon it. Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, today, all e-commerce companies are selling in volumes. Where are you? Who's speaking? Yeah, please. Today, all e-commerce companies are selling in volumes. You know, they're interested more in volumes. 
and create a market, you know, develop the this one. But how, what's the scope for branding? Uh, create a brand uh, in the e-commerce uh, platform, like apparel brand or something like that. So, e-commerce brand, brand like Zovi, right? That's what you have in mind. Separate brand, like uh, like Levi's or something like that, you know. Which Sold only, only through e-commerce e e-commerce platform. You want to talk about it? Sure. Um, we have a company in the U.S. called Bonobos that's created their own private label uh, pants and shirts and stuff like that. I think a lot of commerce companies look at private label as a way to increase their margins because you have, you know, you're just controlling more of the supply chain in some sense. Um, there's definitely scope to do that. I think uh, one thing that at least we look at when looking at companies that are trying to, that are trying to do that is that Building a brand in India is tough. Uh, it takes a long time. Building that trust with consumers, that your brand stands for something, it can be trusted, it delivers every single time, it takes a, it takes a while. Uh, and it's not a five-year sort of horizon. Maybe it's a 10 to 15-year horizon. If you really look in the last 10 years, what brands have been created in India, you know, it's less than 10. So it takes a different level of execution to get to that. But it's certainly a valid thought to you know, increase margins in a business. And, and, and then, once you do create a brand, and we see this in apparel and all, you have to start thinking about offline distribution as well, potentially, to really reach your market. So then that brings in all, a whole set of other complexities there. Maybe it's a good way to test out for some of uh, uh, things which could be very difficult to roll out in a physical format. Can, what's your thought to just create brands which are available online? I think f the first is that you have to have credibility as an e-commerce brand itself. So your site should be a brand which is credible enough. And then of course the second part of it comes the product brands. And uh, you know, one of the things that when, you, when you're online is the fact that consumers have a reference point. So nationally available brand being a reference point on your site is something that helps them to choose. On the other hand, if you don't have a reference point, but you're just presenting an option by itself, then it gets chosen purely as an option. So then it gets a little more commoditized. Like a t-shirt, for example, which might be an unbranded t-shirt, but well-designed, very good graphics. Somebody says, nice looking t-shirt, what's it? It's a low cost, so why don't I buy that? So it's a low risk, low cost kind of thing. But when you start pushing the envelope in terms of prices and start expecting to get better prices, though your brand might be actually capable of delivering those prices, unless you build some momentum around your site, you don't get the opportunity to be able to introduce private brands. So you look at it also from an offline retail. Even as an offline retailer, if you go in initially saying that I, you know, these are Reliance brands and please buy them, nobody would buy. But then once you have an armory, which is a combination of your brands, plus national brands, then you actually are able to present options for somebody to come in and say that, hey, this looks nice and you know it's priced much better, so why didn't I buy it? So creating a private brand, to my mind, I think, takes a little while. You probably need, need to get your online you know, commerce site you know, probably credible to some size before you can actually create a private brand on it. And if you want to talk to well, I just wanted to add quickly that you know, I think um, uh, you know, the need of, you know, maybe the, your, the desire to have that brand independent of channel should, be, should exist on its own merit, right? Then internet can give you a lot of added advantage rather than you creating your own, you know, distribution channels and a lot of other things, right? But, but the thing is, don't come up with a brand because internet exists, right? Right? Come, come up with a brand because that's a need in the market and you, you are uniquely qualified to address it, right? And then you can obviously harness what internet has to offer. That's the only thing I would like. So two more questions. Uh, uh, hi. Hello. Okay. I, I'm Pawan. Uh, I come from a manufacturing background of clothes. So the one question which bothers me about e-commerce is that when I manufacture a particular product, I put in a lot of design, I put in a lot of effort in it. Now, the thing when I get it online, I'm very wary that the low cost manufacturer, because India is a very jugaad based economy. So the thing is that, just as Mr. Kureen mentioned, that the designs get copied very easily and you can manufacture it as a low cost. So what happens is when I manufacture, I 
put in that designing cost, the extra effort I put in, I need to reap that from the market. When I put it online, it is available to everybody. The design gets copied and the value proposition of my goods come down. So what is your take on that? Take that. I think uh, this is an age-old problem. And the only way you can uh, reduce this is by protecting your IP with a brand. And when, when the brand is available and there is a premium available for that brand, then only the IP gets protected. So if you are if you are trying to push a product which is high quality, high design value, and there is the fake product, consumers ultimately know what they are buying. And that's where the, the, the previous question about the brand comes in. So, so build a strong brand and, um, you know, then online just becomes a channel for you. In fact, uh, <clears throat> I think online today is helping a lot of uh, small people to create a lot of brands, you know, from a manufacturing perspective. Um, we have seen so many, we are in a category where there's a lot of unorganized uh, people contributing to the system. And we bring those people onto our store and in six months we find consumers asking that I want that brand, which actually is not a brand, but because it's now available and is visible, not as a commodity, but as something which has graphics and has an individuality. So consumers start developing affinity and a premium for that. So it's, it depends how, how you use the channel for, for your business, you know. Okay. So one last question. Yeah. My name is Mukul Goel. I represent DSC Global. It's a supply chain uh, consulting 4PL firm. Uh, my question is, do you see a potential for uh, B2B uh, e-commerce, sort of like a big B to a small B type of a scenario where you are partnering with a small business and utilizing his front end for pushing your inventory? Anyone wants to take it? Uh, see, I sit on the, the uh, board of this company called India Mart, which is a B2B marketplace. So certainly there is a potential. There's a huge potential on B2B, but it has its own different dynamics and issues. Anyone See, wants to take So it? I'll just uh, uh, give you a couple of numbers. Uh, so globally, e-commerce is a $600 billion market, right? So $600 billion of total global retail is online, which is B2C, right? But the B2B is, from some estimate, could be as high as $3 trillion. So B2B, actually, we don't come to know because we all are, you know, we may be part of the B2B venture or whatever, uh, you know, everyone... I, I'm B2B for someone, I'm B2C for someone, right? But, but the thing is, uh, B2B in general, you know, there are a lot of procurements type of, there are a lot of procurement type of play, plays, there are a lot of supply chain uh, type of play. But B2B in terms of transaction, sheer transaction volume is five to six times bigger than the B2C global commerce. Okay, so I, I guess you can... Um interact with the panelists as they move out, as happens in most conferences, and get your answers. Thank you very much. I think we had a good discussion, interesting time. All the best. <laughs>